Hi, this is the Reverend Dr. Dwayne Alexander Miller in Madrid. It's uh, nine in the morning here. And uh, Mark, tell us a little bit about who you are and, and where you are. I am the Reverend Dr. Mark Dury, and it's five o'clock in the evening here in Australia. And I'm I'm busy these days writing and teaching about um, discipling people from a Muslim background and have been involved in leading a, a congregation of Muslim background believers in Melbourne for the last decade or so. Um, so I'm very interested in the in the the challenge of discipleship, and I actually think that probably this is one of the greatest challenges facing the church today is discipleship in general, but particularly in Muslim background believer communities, there are quite acute issues that are, are fundamental. And, and why do you see that as a particularly urgent uh, urgent matter or urgent issue? Well. It's chronic. Um, it's urgent for Muslim background believers because millions are turning to Christ. And the risk is that this harvest will rot out in the fields. It won't be brought into the barns. <laughs> the risk is that people will fall away in disappointment and frustration because the discipleship is not effective. So it's about building healthy churches and um, working out how to do that in, in these Islamic contexts. And uh, there's a lot of evidence that, that there has been more attrition than is really acceptable or, or you know it's it's deeply concerning that you see people coming to Christ often in the midst of miracles and through a powerful intervention of God and then they falter and fall back or or the result is a church that is sort of half-baked it's not it's not on a good track and a lot of divisions and conflicts and difficulties so um I think there's this view often in the West that the challenge is to evangelize the world, but I think the challenge is to disciple the world, <laughs> and evangelism is one piece in that. But it's it's not it's not the end goal. Jesus said, "Make disciples." It's 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 part of the, I think, the great rediscovery of the um, of the Great Commission uh, and understanding what does it mean to to really live that out beyond evangelism into making disciples. Yeah, so let's talk about some of the ideas and maybe the strengths and some weaknesses. You know, you and I have talked about this before. You and I have, I think, I think we've met in person one time at the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary, but we've been in touch with each other for, for multiple years. You and I have both published on kind of the more practical aspect of, of reaching Muslims with the gospel. And then what we're talking about here, not just the evangelism, but actually helping them to grow into, you know, mature, fruitful um, disciples of Christ, who hopefully will then go on and make other disciples, which I think is the model that Jesus has in mind. But I think in the evangelical and just the Protestant world, when we look at the, the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century, we, we have some, some trends about discipleship and what that means to make disciples, um, and, and maybe some of the limitations and problems with uh, some of those. Uh, one of the most clear one that, that comes to my mind is that discipleship is a, a program. You know, discipleship is here are five lessons to disciple people, or, you know, here's a book that has a discipleship program that is going to work in all these different contexts. There's not anything necessarily wrong about that, but it seems like a very curtailed, truncated vision of, of discipleship. What, what are your thoughts on, on, on that? Yeah, I think in the 20th century, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, there were a number of um, Western sort of broadly evangelical discipleship movements that were launched, including Navigators, um, Campus Crusade for Christ, InterVarsity, and they all have these programmatic characteristics. And um, Don Little has called these movements modernist in the sense that they, and I think it's not a bad term, in the sense that they see human beings being able to kind of master their spiritual environment through process that is that is managed and broken up into steps and and stages and phases and um the the vision behind this i think is multiplication that is if, if one person could just uh, disciple five people for example and they disciple five people and they disciple five people you know in in two or three generations, the whole world would be disabled. <laughs> so yeah. there's this there's this kind of logic. And I think it's it's also been part of the the, the freeing up of the laity. This, you know, in the past, before these movements, um, 
discipleship was really in some ways the province of the clergy pastoral care it was part of pastoral care i think um mm -hmm. and catechesis and so these these um protestant movements have have really uh, aimed at raising up lots and lots of lay people who are all discipling old people and uh, i think there's been a great impact through that uh, billy graham's missions were often associated linked with navigator disciple teams that would come so these approaches have spread very widely throughout the Protestant churches around the world. Um, they, I mean, I, I'm thankful for them. I think I, I know many of my colleagues who, who are in ministry and effective are, are continuing as Christians because they were discipled through a process such as this, often at university. Um, someone took an interest in them, met with them, read the Bible with them, took them through the steps. <laughs> Uh, and it's been effective. So I'm thankful for that. But I, I don't think these methods work very well for Muslim background believers for a number of reasons. Um, and uh, and I, I suspect there's lots of missionaries trying to apply these processes in, in well, Islamic contexts, but often with um, <clears throat> great disappointment and frustration. Yeah, and, and that observation, now you, you're focused more on discipleship. I published, I think it was last year, a book called um, I Will Give Them an Everlasting Name, Pastoral Care for Christ Converts from Islam. Um, and, and without getting too much into it, I think pastoral care and discipleship overlap, but I think we can distinguish between the two. But but, but they have a lot of uh, final concerns in common, you know. And so that, that was part of what inspired me to, to do that, uh, to write that book, which is a short little book and, and quite easy to read. I think you could easily finish it in a weekend or so. And, and it's not a technical book. It's, it, I, I tried to write something that was very practical. And what I did is I just looked at my experiences doing research and ministry among converts from Islam, all, really all over the place, North America, Europe, the Near East, uh, Asia Minor, North Africa. I, I've been to all these places and just trying to see what was actually working there in practice, because I think you've said something important, Mark, what has been working in the West uh, might not work, oftentimes actually does not work in the context of uh, believers who come from a Muslim background. I think part of that is a shift from modernity to late modernity or post-modernity. And I think part of that is, is just a very profound cultural uh, difference. So, um, so yeah, I'm 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 uh, on on board with with what you're saying, and I've I've definitely noticed that as well. That um, you know some of the the key problems and issues that we find with believers who come from Islam, um, our, our pastoral preparation as pastors and ministers and priests, uh, oftentimes doesn't prepare us to to really help them. Yeah, it's 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 very interesting that even in the West, those. Um modernist approaches have been recognized by their own exponents as problematic. Um, uh, one book that discusses this is This Kingdom Life, which contributions by Dallas Willard and others, and it, it lists a whole series of things that these modernist disciples would like to see discipleship doing, which it hasn't been doing. Um, I mean, three things I, I find that, um, that it doesn't do. Um, there will there's, there's other things as well, which your beautiful little book pick up, but three things that have been particularly on my mind. One is um, the issue of healing the soul. Um, if you're very broken and damaged from trauma, um, from spiritual commitments you've made, um, from generational patterns in your culture and society, it's very hard to profit from a um a disciple making strategy of the kind that we've mentioned you know like a navigator strategy because you're you need to be healed first you you just got too much going on i mean if, if you walk into a navigator's program and your primary kind of most urgent problem is demonic attack um you know that's another aspect too so one is um, healing the soul, the wounded soul, which, are, you know, is part of pastoral care, but it is actually a key part of discipleship as well. Another is spiritual warfare and dealing with the demonic, um, which is a, a really significant issue for people coming out of Islam. Um, and I, I, I've got a lot more to say about that, but um, 
I think. Well, you 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 have a book on that. I actually have it right over here. <laughs> I have, yeah, and uh, um, uh, that's a big issue. I mean, one of the one of the things I identified in that book, "Liberty to the Captives," which has just come out in a new edition with a training module as well, is that Islam imposes um, spiritual covenants on on Muslims and also on non-Muslims that live in Islamic contexts. And those spiritual con covenants are quite powerful in controlling people's spiritual life. And when someone leaves Islam, they actually need to be set free from that covenantal structure. And, and my experience has been in discipling Muslim background believers that establishing freedom from that, um, that covenantal structure, the covenant of Islam, if you like, is a huge part of uh, establishing discipleship at all. You know, if you don't do that, then many other things will you, that you'll try will fail. Uh, the third thing I think um, th th that's missing in some of those Western approaches, in addition to healing the soul, dealing with demonic and spiritual warfare issues, the third one is what does it mean to promote life in the spirit? How do you disciple people to live, to to receive and live in the spirit of the Lord? You know. This is a, a perspective that's been reduced in Western Protestant tradition. I know it's central in the Orthodox tradition. You know, um, the life of the Spirit is just of central emphasis in Orthodox in Orthodox discipleship. But that's that's quite in, another important area. Yeah. So uh, we've uh, maybe I could talk a little bit about the issue of um, leaving Islam. I. We had this, this experience in ministry of helping people come out of the occult, new age and other spiritual bondages. And at the same time, I was also working on understanding Islam from the ground up, like deep, deeply investigating the life of Muhammad, the structure of the, of the expectations of Islam. And as I was studying these, I thought this is actually, this reminds me of, of some of what we've seen with people coming out of witchcraft and the new age, this is a spiritual bondage. And so I, I began to describe that and I developed sets of prayers comparable to what people have used for um, other spiritual bondages to apply to Islam. And then as I was doing that, in the midst of that, one day 60 ex-Muslims or people in the process of leaving Islam came to the church and said, will you be our pastor? Which was a bit of a shock at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, I can't really turn them away. So we we began working with them and then we began applying these principles of setting people free from these bondages. Uh, and um, that's been a fruitful work. Uh, it's been deep. We've seen deep changes in people's lives. And, yeah, and, it's, and, and sorry, it, just uh, let me jump in here. In, in your book, one thing I like is that it's not all ideas. You actually have, you know, rites or rituals or a ceremony of, of renouncing particularly harmful things, for example, as I recall, anti-Semitism, or the idea that men are created one step above the woman, which is a verse right out of the Quran, um, you know, and, and um, you know, kind of explicitly saying, I renounce these ideas. I, when I think of, of uh, this, this sort of preparation and discipleship and, um, and the, the difficulty of what, what we're talking about here, I, I kind of think like a lot of Christians, a lot of ministers in the West look at Islam as like, okay, we have a house on a foundation and the house is Islam and we're, we're going to get rid of that house and we're going to build a new house, which is the Christian house. But I think maybe a better way of looking at it is you, that the foundation itself is, is already flawed. Like you cannot build another house on that foundation. You, you're going to actually have to excavate that foundation and pour a brand new foundation. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if you would agree with that analogy, but um, do you have uh, maybe a couple of other examples of some of those explicit renunciations? Uh, you know, I discard, I, I renounce this belief or this practice. Yes, indeed. I, I, by the way, I do agree with your analysis. And I, I think um, Christians have made the mistake of seeing Islam as a kind of heresy of Christianity, that you could just fix it up a bit and it would be okay. And that's a very old idea. And it's a very flawed idea, really mistaken idea. But you know, some of the problems that you see in Muslim background believers include competitiveness, the desire to be superior to others. This is very Islamic. 
Um, the, the Quran says that Muslims are, are the best people. And there's lots well, and lots of traditions of Muhammad that speak about who's superior to what and what's superior to who and on and on it goes. And um, this causes lots of problems. So um, I, I wrote a prayer for announcing false sense of superiority <laughs> um, uh -huh. and, and choosing to embrace the character of Jesus Christ who humbled himself and became nothing, you know, to, to, to serve and save us. Um, the symptoms of that are, for example, if you appoint a leader in a Muslim background believer church, it's quite possible that other, other people will feel offended or hurt by your appointment because they'll say, you have rejected me. And why have you appointed that person? I'm just as good as them. And, and they will arc up and, um, and even go to war <laughs> over this. Mm -hmm. So raising anyone up to leadership in that context is quite dangerous and difficult at times. So that, that quest for superiority is difficult. Um, it's a huge problem in, in discipling people. So if you, there's one young man and I would say to him, he's in another church and I would say to him, you know, how's your church going? And he'd say, oh, it's great. <laughs> mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I knew it wasn't. But every time mm -hmm. I talked to him, it was the same. Oh, it's amazing, amazing. And I thought, how can I help this guy? How can anyone help this guy? Because he's, mm -hmm. he's always amazing, you know? And um, <laughs> I had this really interesting uh, encounter with a couple that I've been discipling. I'm now leading the Iranian church in Melbourne that I've worked with. The very first meeting, I said, do you have any problems? And they said, no, no, we're, we're fine. And then the next week I asked again, no, oh no, we're fine. And the third week I asked again and they said, no, it's all good. And, and I said, oh, I'm, I'm really upset to hear that, you know? And they uh -huh. said, why? And I said, well, either you've got problems and you don't know, and that's not good, or you've got problems and you're not telling me, and that's not good. So which is it? <laughs> and, and they were like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> and then we began the journey of um, actually becoming transparent and being willing to get help. But I think that journey that we did of actually working through the nitty gritty of what does it mean to make yourself vulnerable enough because you're not trying to be superior all the time. That journey was backed by the ritual or by the prayer of renouncing superiority and actually before the Lord saying, I reject that in the name of Jesus. Another... Yeah, other... that's a... Go ahead. <laughs> There are some other things as well. Um, I think there can be deep bondages to the Quran, to the example of Muhammad. So we ask people to renounce the example of Muhammad. Um, lying is a big problem in all Islamic cultures. Mm -hmm. Like I, I was amazed when I was working in Aceh in Indonesia to find out how many different words there were for lying. And mm -hmm. um, the root of it is that Islam actually promotes and even commands lying in some contexts. For example, a husband should lie to his wife to keep a happy marriage or it's permissible to lie to reconcile friends or reduce conflicts you're allowed to lie if you would otherwise reveal a crime that you've committed that nobody else knows about muhammad would rebuke people who confessed to him that they'd done wrong um now all these 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 threads that are part of the sharia um come together and create a culture in which um lying is is um inbuilt in lots of different ways into the culture and so when someone comes to Christ to actually learn to tell the truth, which also relates to this issue of transparency and discipleship, is difficult. And so as part of the preparation for baptism, when people are renouncing Islam, we, we ask them to renounce lying and deception and, and um, you, know, you know, really challenge that as a spiritual bondage. You know, it's something that is deep in the soul, really. Um, so yeah, these these things have um, been significant, very significant. Um, anger. One young man had problems with really bitter anger, and um, losing his temper. And when he came to renounce the example of Muhammad, he couldn't say the words, and he was shocked because he said, "Oh, I haven't been following this for years." But he said, he would say, "I renounce," mm, and he couldn't say the word. So I'd oh, right. oh, oh, this is a sign of a of a hold, you know, a spiritual hold. So. We took him through that and just strengthened him and reminded him of his identity in Christ. And he was able to, to renounce the example of Muhammad. But what changed in his life was that he, um, the anger went away. He was set free from anger. And he became a really effective discipler and encourager of others when he was released from that. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's been really exciting to see 
to see the fruit uh, in people's lives. Yeah, uh, you mentioned the word vulnerable, and uh, I think that's a very interesting word, and I've, I've heard that come up in a lot of different spiritual and religious contexts in, in the last couple of years. I think it went from being something that people didn't really talk about very much to being something that, that there's a general sense that vulnerability is something very important, um, and, and it comes from the Latin word vulna, which means a wound. Right. So a vulnerable person is, is a person who can be wounded, who is placing themselves in a position where they're like, I am not on the defensive, I'm not on the offensive, I am here, you know, um, and, uh, and that's really hard for the human being, especially when you're coming from uh, like an honor shame culture, where, you know, not being able to open yourself up to being wounded, or to being discredited, or to being insulted, um, or to be undervalued or whatever, that is, uh, that's so important. I really like what you're uh, saying about, and I think I, do, I think about baptism here, which is such a, an important um, sacrament or rite. Uh, I remember one example from a church, an Iranian church back in the States where the pastor who was Presbyterian, he said, you know, one of the big problems we have is uh, backbiting, right? That, you know, somebody will be very nice to another Iranian believer, but then they'll go around and they'll just tell everyone, oh, did you hear what such and such did to me? Such and such is such a bad person. So they actually built it into their baptismal liturgy uh, that, that if, if somebody insults you, that you're going to follow the example that Jesus gave, and you're going to go directly to that person and address it with them. Um, and uh, so, I mean, that's just one example of, of, of an awareness and, and of an effort to try to uh, address some of these issues. That's in terms a beautiful, of the... yeah, beautiful thing to do and, and very, very important. There's a word in Farsi for it, tarof, which is to put on a fake face. You know, it's it's part of the mm -hmm. culture. It's very recognized. Yeah. So uh, right now you're doing a, a course on discipleship, right? Tell us a little bit about uh, what what um, how that's going and and what sort of materials you're using, because I'm guessing some people are going to be watching this and thinking, wow, I'm these are some neat ideas. Where, where can I actually get something, you know, either on the internet or from a bookstore um, and to, to, uh, to look into these uh, issues in a more kind of systematic and orderly manner rather than just two Anglican priests chatting? Well, I must admit, I've learned a lot from Don Little's course on um, which he offers through the Wesley Bible Seminary and um, the Lilius Trotter Center on discipleship and church planting in, in Muslim context. Um, this course that I'm teaching is at, at the Melbourne School of Theology and about half the course is on what is discipleship. So we look at um, the Bible, the New Testament, what does it mean to be a disciple in the New Testament? And uh, we look at the history of thought about that, uh, how the, tra the tradition has constructed the task of making disciples. Um, and also look at this issue of modernist discipleship, the crisis, I call it, of, of the modernist discipleship. And um, it's actually a course in cross-cultural disciple making. So about a quarter of the course is on the challenge of cross-cultures, oh, you know, the, the role of worldviews, issues of contextualization, um, differences in word meanings, um, ethnography of different ways of communicating, understanding that in context. And about a quarter of the course is on Islam. So we're talking about these issues of um, how, do, how do you form disciples out of really broken, broken backgrounds. Um, there are a few really good, good books on um, uh, where people have written about the challenge of reaching Muslims, uh, this, uh, of discipling Muslims. Don Little's book on um, uh, effective discipleship in Muslim communities is a good one. There's the burden of baggage by Roy Oxnabad on um, Iranians coming to Christ, and 